Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is U.S. Army Colonel John Agnello, who is the director of the Army's Program Office for Information Advantage, where he oversees the development and implementation of, informa- of information advantage across elements of the .MLPF, which stands for Doctrine, Organization, Training, Material, Leadership, Personnel, Facilities, and Policy for the Army. John Agnello, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Hey, thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. Likewise, likewise. And so uh, what we're going to be talking about today, unsurprisingly, is information advantage. But uh, if we may, John, before we get into this topic, could we start by just getting your overall comment or assessment about uh, our strategic landscape or the uh, times in which we live? Oh, no, thank, thanks for that. I appreciate it. No, I think definitely the information environment, you know, is ever-changing landscape every day. Um, you know, it takes government, military, industry, academia, all of us together. Uh, we have to account for it. Uh, you know, these organizations must account for the information space more and more every day. And, you know, as we continue to cede ground to our adversaries every day in the information environment, uh, we just, I think that we have to work together across the entire landscape of military, government, uh, industry, and academia to to really, to really look for a way to uh, continue uh, to to better our information path um, for the gov- for the for the country, really. Ah, yeah, sure, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think John, it might be helpful to our audience to if if maybe you could give just like a a quick career recap, uh, which which helps set the stage for the rest of the discussion. Oh yeah, yeah. Thanks. So. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a cyber officer in the United States Army stationed at Fort Gordon, Georgia. Um, I originally was, I was commissioned as a field artillery officer. Um, I have a computer science degree from Hofstra University in New York. Um, you know, with the, with the artillery background, you know, better understanding fires and effects. Um, had a really good opportunity to, to do some really interesting jobs as an artillery officer. Then I switched over to, to a functional area called information, uh, or correction, information uh, system information officer for the army. Um, so got to do that job for a little bit, but then moved over to army cyber, um, when we first stood up and had a great opportunity to learn in cyber command, NSA and and army cyber, um, what it looks like at the strategic level in the cyberspace. Um, That's about what, what time frame was that, John? Uh, so 2011, I think, is right about the time that I okay. you know, switched over to become into the cyber world. Mm-hmm. Um, got to do some jobs at, at Fort Meade for a couple of years, then uh, got to go to Germany, do some interesting jobs over there. Um, came back to Fort Meade, got to work for, directly for Cyber Command, doing some really interesting uh, offensive cyber work with a, with a OIC as a, as a joint um, offensive cyber team. Um, and then doing that for a few years. Then I became the, the director of development for U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, so all, all offensive and defensive capabilities in addition to um, analytics uh, and data science all fell under me. And I also ran the um, developmental network for uh, U.S. Cyber Command. So really interesting work in the cyberspace, uh, but tying in the operational uh, usage in uh, the artillery world, I think, definitely helps in the information space. So understanding effects, understanding how you integrate various um, elements into the battle space, I think is a true, is what, what we're talking about when we talk about information advantage, when we talk about the information environment, information dimension, uh, all of those pieces are part of um, when we're talking about delivering effects on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that all of those together, I think, is what really helps, you know, move forward 
uh, where we're going in the information space. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. That really does help set the stage. And so um, I wanted to start getting a little bit more into uh, uh, what you're doing in the program office for information advantage. And uh, as you were just describing, I mean, this sounds like it's a, a really expansive uh, scope of responsibility. But, you know, like, if you were talking to a, a group of high school kids, or if you were talking uh, to some people at a picnic, and someone asked you or on, on a plane, you know, like, uh, oh, wow, you're in the army, what do you do? And, you know, to, how would you describe to an ordinary citizen, you know, you know what information advantage is? And uh, why does it matter? So it's funny because my uh, I see my job now as more of a herding cats type of guy, uh, you know. So as I lead the the information advantage campaign of learning for the army, so you know we look at the space. There's multiple players out there. You know, there's the army, there's academia, there's industry, there's government. Um, in the army alone, there's multiple stakeholders uh, that have skin in the game when it comes to information advantage. Uh, you know, so I work for I, I'm in part of the Army Cyber Center of Excellence. But I also work closely with the Mission Command Center of Excellence, Special Operations Community, the Intelligence Community. On the operational side, work with you know U.S. Cyber Command, Army Cyber Command, the Theater Armies, uh, U.S. Forces Command, uh, trade, trade, Training and Doctrine Command, the Army Staff, and other multiple you know various uh, force providers out there. Um, you know, the, all these organizations are key in helping us to achieve an information advantage in the battle space. Um, you know, as well as changing the mindset of army leaders and soldiers uh, with respect to what it could, how to conduct information activities in the operational environment. Uh, you know, what I think I kind of do here is, that, you know, I'm trying to teach and learn and, and assess and and look at how do we ch how do we change a culture? You mm -hmm. know, and it has to start at the highest senior leaders in the army, but also simultaneously, it has to start at the junior soldier that just coming in the army. You know, I hate using the phrase that we, you know, we, we build the airplane in flight. We talk about that a lot. Um, but, you know, really, that's what it is. You know, we're we're executing a ton of different tasks based on a whole lot of, you know, planning assumptions across the Army um, as we wait for a bunch of significant decisions made from our senior leaders in the Army. Uh, you know, even just to start with the concept for information advantage uh, for the Army of 20, 30 and 40 is still pending approval. So, right? yeah, you know, so and, you know, doctrine still not finalized and such. But as we move along, really what we do is we we have to we bring all these different pieces together to try and, you know, push information advantage across the finish line. I see. Yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you about doctrine, but you you, you just answered my question. Uh, question that it's it's being formulated it sounds like is, is this something that that your team is is leading or are you a, a contribute contributing uh uh effort to to that effort or you know how do you guys integrate with uh this creation of the doctrine related to information advantage so i guess kind of way i would start that is uh you know the idea of information advantage um, has, has kind of been around in the Army for a little while now. And, you know, once we officially released the Doctrine F, uh, Field Manual 3-0 last year in October, multi-domain operations is when they that, that doctrinal, that base doctrinal pre uh, document uh, addressed information advantage and the ideas of convergence um, and across the competition continuum, really from competition, crisis, and conflict, you know, how do we conduct... Uh, how do we do multi-domain operations? And what, what information advantage really is, is that piece of multi-domain operations. So, you know, when we talk about convergence, it's bringing a bunch of mission enablers simultaneously um, to execute activities really at the theater and core level. Um, you know, when we talk about the Army Doctrine for Information Advantage, right now we're in the final draft of um, Army Doctrinal uh, Publication ADP 3-13, which is titled Information. Uh, that document will, will officially be released first quarter of FY24, so probably in October of this year. Uh, once we actually get that released, 
uh, we'll start working on Field Manual 3-13, uh, which is actually going to be entitled Information Advantage. Um, the current FM 313 is actually Information Operations. Um, so what I want people to understand is that, you know, Information Advantage does not equal Information Operations. Information Operations really is one of those five, what I like to say is the five tribes, what it makes, what makes up IA. So when we talk about these five tribes, uh, you know, we have you know, cyber and electronic warfare. You know, those are those that's where I kind of fall under the, 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 the uh, branch of cyber. Um, as I said, information operations is a subset of IA. Uh, public affairs is a piece. Um, civil affairs is a piece. And psychological operations is a piece. So those five tribes, well, we also incorporate intelligence and, and the intelligence community throughout, uh, you know, these five tribes execute information activities all together uh, in support of the commander's objectives. You know, so all of these, all of these are key. Um, and when we talk about what's in ADP 313, the upcoming doctrine for it, um, that, that doctrine actually defines what are we call the five functions of information advantage. So those five functions are enable, protect, inform, influence, and attack. Uh, so when we talk about those five functions, enable means um, enable decision-making. How, do how do we help a commander make a decision faster, better, more informed? Protect we talk about protecting friendly information. So that goes everything from operational security, that goes to really covering concealment, that goes to protecting our, 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 our network infrastructure, that goes to counterintelligence. All of those pieces fall under that protect function. We talk about inform. Uh, so inform, that's one's kind of owned by our public affairs arena. You know, that's how do we inform ourselves? How do we inform our soldiers, our leaders, how do we inform our families? How do we inform the U.S. populace? But also, how do we inform um, international audiences? How do we inform our, our partners and our allies? Then we talk about the other, the fourth uh, function, really influence. You know, how do we influence our adversaries to kind of do the, move in the direction we want? How do we influence, um, you know, how do we influence other nations around the world or other uh, target uh, audiences. How do we uh, how do we in influence target audiences to really kind of move the way we want them to, in order to achieve the objectives we have on the battlefield? Um, and then the final one, attack. Um, so we we originally when we when we were looking at the doctrine, we really looked at originally using the term information warfare, um, but then that was kind of put to the wayside. Um, because in our current doctrine and in, in a lot of our publications, when we talk about information warfare, we really use that term only for our adversaries. So, you know, the Chinese, the, the Russians, that they use information warfare. Um, and we want to make sure that we're, you know, that we don't want to get confused with, we don't want our, our you know, our um, Americans to look at that we're doing the same thing that our adversaries are doing. So we don't, you know, we, we pulled away from that. But another big thing was when we use the term attack. We also incorporate physical destruction. So you can do, when we talk about attack, you can do cyber, you can do EW, you can do space. Those are all things that are attack functions. Um, but one thing we're missing there is physical destruction. So if we drop a bomb on a building, you know, that that's definitely going to influence someone. You know, that mm, even mm -hmm. the physical dimension, you know, when we talk about the operational environment in the army, you know, we say there's only one operational environment. We say there's three dimensions in that operational environment. There's the information dimension, the human dimension, and the physical dimension. We could drop a bomb in the physical dimension, but it's obviously going to affect the human dimension because, you know, humans obviously are the ones that are on on the on the physic on the on the earth, and it's going to infect. It's going to cause an effect in the information space in the information dimension because. You know, you're, you're doing something to influence others by dropping a bomb on them. So that's a big piece when we talk about tax. So all of those five functions together is how we, where we look at executing information activities um, in the operational environment. That's the dimension, that's the direction the Army's going when we talk about information advantage 
in conducting multi-domain operations. Okay. Wow. You said a lot there. So those, those five functions that you recapped a moment ago, those, those are the information advantage functions or is that right? Yeah. So when we talk, so the way that the army's looking at it is so the joint force put, took information and made it, you know, it's a joint war fighting function. So the army looked at it a little differently. The army um, said, we don't want to, we, we don't want in, in the joint force, we conduct um, operations in the information environment. OIE. Okay. Um, so in the army, we kind of stepped back a little bit from that. And we said, well, we don't want to say we have an information environment. We want to look at, there's only one, there's only, there, there's only one, operational environment that we fight in but in that operational environment there's three dimensions as i said before the the physical the human and the information so we do things in those three and we want to achieve an information advantage we want to achieve a human advantage and we want to achieve a physical advantage over our adversaries now you know kind of a long way of answering your question because why I brought, bring this up is, you know, the, the five functions are, yes, those enable, protect, inform, influence, and attack mm -hmm. are the five functions that make up information advantage. Um, a, a really important thing to look at is, you know, when we talk about what's the definition of an inf of information advantage, it's really a condition. You know, we say it's a condition when, when a force holds the initiative in terms of situational understanding, decision making, and relevant actor behavior, so we, you know, we want to, uh, we want to reach the condition or set the condition of an information advantage across the three dimensions in the operational environment, in order to achieve decision dominance, in order to, in order to achieve, um, in order to get our make our commanders make a better, faster, more well-informed decision over adversaries. And we use those five functions of information advantage to uh, better frame the way we conduct information activities in, in theater. You know, that's really, really what it comes down to is the, it's a, there are buckets we use to look at how we're doing information activities um, across the operational environment. Mm, wow. Okay. Um, I wanted to circle back to a point that you made a couple of minutes ago and, and, and see if you could like overlay that on top of what you were just describing as well, John. Uh, you, you mentioned what I recall you mentioning, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, is that part of your role right now is uh, as, a, as, as a cat herder. And uh, I suppose that all, uh, what what I'm taking that to mean is that you're you're educating the force a bit here, and you're uh, you're trying to uh, bring the army along with a, a mindset shift from like a purely kinetic uh, kind of a, a, a inclination to something that doesn't preclude kinetic but it also is bringing in this you know much more non-kinetic information kind of an engagement space um there's a there's a question in there somewhere <laughs> how do you respond to all that <laughs> so i guess the way i would take that is i'd say you know um when we look at the information space um there's things that you know, there, there's things that are tangible things that are intangible you know so you know, tangibly, we can drop a bomb on someone, you know, tangibly, we can execute, let's, I mean, you could even say you know, tangible, a tangible effect. Um, if we did an offensive cyber activity against someone, you know, you can see something happen, you can, you can block, you can, you know, you can disrupt, you can block, you can ma manipulate data. Um, but when we talk about the information dimension, and executing information activities, a lot of times these aren't tangible. You know, they're not physical. So it's the really we look at we look at how do we change a mindset? How do we um, how do we make our adversaries kind of go in the direction we want them to, or not go in the direction that they want to? How do we 
um, in how do we better influence them? But also at the same time, how do we do all these different tasks that are out there? And how do we how do we actually um, you know it's hard to look at something that's intangible. How do we measure that? You know, so that's that's the that's a really hard thing. And when you know we talk about senior leaders that have been in the army for 30, 40, 30, 40 years, and you know, in the last 20 years, we've worked in this, we've worked in, in this a lot of the counterinsurgency type of fight. And we now switching the army to looking back at uh, large scale combat operations, um, you know, think all the way back to the Cold War aspect. And we're looking at large scale combat operations at the same time we're doing these kinetic type of activities. You know, how can we shape the battlefield or how can we set the theater by doing these different things in the information space and teaching our senior leaders that, you know, when they meet with a, you know, a senior leader engagement, when you're meeting with, uh, say, you, say you're meeting with uh, the Secretary of Defense of a different country, the Ministry of Defense of a different country, you know, that key leader engagement is critical. You know, how, how you're talking with them is how you can inform them and also influence them. But at the same time, how can we, how can we tangibly uh, measure um, how the populace is actually uh, how do the how does the populace see us there? But also, how do they see uh, their own government? How do they see mm. how our adversaries are affecting them? How do we measure that? How do we how do we do a you know a civil military operation in theater? How do we measure that it's effective? All of this is parts of the information space. Now, let's not forget the huge you know, elephant in the room of social media. So you know, that's a huge influencer piece out there, you know, and, and everyone carries a cell phone. Everyone's got a picture of that, uh, you know, the tank driving down the road. Um, and, and where is that tank going? So, you know, you put, as soon as you post it on, on social media, you know, it, it's out there in, in the ether for everyone to see. So we have to account for that that, you know, that and how do we account for the, the individual citizen out there with their cell phone, taking pictures, taking video and interacting with others and putting their points of view out there? We have to account for that. All of that is really hard to physically measure, but it, it's really the way as we move forward in a techno, you know, as a technological force and technologically advanced uh, country and world, we have to account for all this stuff that's in the information space in order to be successful. All right, great. Um, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to maybe ask if you could talk with a little bit more specifics about some of the things that you and your team are doing now, John, uh, working on various different material solutions across the uh, .mlpf landscape. Do you think you could touch on some of that? Yeah, sure. So uh, when we talk about the .mlpf P, you know, I, I kind of already touched on the doctrine piece. That's that's the big D there. And when we talk about organizational structure, so O organizational. Um, you know, the big one we're looking with that is the Army's, uh, we've been looking at this organizational structure called the TIAD, the Theater Information Advantage Detachment. Nice. Uh, so the idea of this yeah. Theater Information Advantage Detachment um, is it's a 65 soldier team that sits at the theater Army level. Uh, right now, the Army's looking at de de designing three of them. So we'd have one that would work for the U.S. the U.S. Army Pacific um, commander. One that would work for the USER URAF, so U.S. Army Europe and Africa commander, and then one would, that would work for the U.S. Army Cyber Command commander. So the two that are theater aligned would work directly for. They'd be regionally and theater aligned to the Pacific theater and the European theater, and then that um, U.S. Army Army Cyber. Uh, TIAD would really be a global uh, organization that would look at um, how they could how they could do a reinforcing role to those two theaters, but also look at the information space globally and how can they make effects in that. So these TIADs are an interesting organization because they're we look at them as a as really a direct doer 
to meet um, operational objectives for the theater army commander. So the team brings those five, the five tribes I talked about together. Um, you, you have an information warfare team and you have an engagement team, you have an assessment team, um, and you have an intel team really is those, the, those are the big buckets that fall on that organizational structure. And really what we look at these guys doing is, you know, they sit at the theater army level. Um, they go, they would interact with the theater army staff. So really kind of focused on that G39 at the theater army um, would be the one that kind of brings that authorities and, you know, really strategic planning type of piece to them. Um, well, the, well, the tide can go out there and do operate, you know, do uh, information activities in theater. So we look at them, the engagement team would go out downrange and, and, and meet with uh, country teams, meet in the embassy, uh, really kind of work with that pull mill type of thing and see how can they, um, how can they do activities in theater to help influence and inform um, these different countries and how can we work with our partners to do these different types of information activities to kind of meet our commander's intent? Now, the biggest thing when we talk about these this TIAD is they're, they're specifically focused during competition phase and the competition continuum. So, you know, we've got organizations that do things in crisis and conflict, but we don't really have something that focuses on, on competition every day mm -hmm. so the idea is that these are organi this organization is downrange doing activities every day to help the commander meet his objectives and with the intent of if we continue to do our information activities successfully we don't increase to crisis and conflict and if we're in crisis and conflict these these organization can help us go back to competition so understanding that we're always in competition, that's the really the big piece we're doing with mm -hmm. that. So that organizational structure is waiting some final approvals from the from the army staff and senior leaders. And but that's where direction we're going that. So now you talk to the T, the training aspect, we're really kind of talking about how can what are environments that we can do to help our organizations train on this in this type of environment? Um, you know, I could kind of jump to the next one with materiel. So really training the materiel, those big materiel solutions we're talking about is right now the, the army, we, we have a, um, the base document that has to do with the overarching material solutions for information advantage. Here's a tongue twister for you. It's the IDIS ICD, the okay. information dimension, information system, initial capabilities document. So that's right now pending uh, the final approval from the army to actually be officially blessed off to be a, to be a thing from that document, then we can write requirements documents um, for individual requirements, and then we can develop what those capabilities are that would be under that. Why we need this is across the army right now. You know we have programs or record that do stuff and things, but we also have organizations that are doing their own work and doing great work, but they go and buy things off the shelf and they just act, they just do it and use it to, to, to help their mission. Well, how can we take those people, those organ, those things that are non uh, program a record. And also how can we take those, all those various program records that are out there and how can we consolidate them under one umbrella to kind of look at what that material solution should be across the board. You know, we, we, we see it as uh, really, we have four buckets that we want to, excuse me, four buckets on how we want to actually look at um, doing or, or building capabilities for the army. Um, really, we're looking at target audience engagement. So how do we, how do we engage, um, what, what, would be, what would be material solutions that would help us engage an audience then mm -hmm. information dimension analysis and assessment so how do we how do we analyze what's out there in the environment and then how do we assess it a third one being critical uh inf critical operations and in intel info conceals so like how do we do um what do we do to protect our information and, and conceal uh, what we're doing against our adversaries and then the fourth bucket Really, and this is an interesting one. So we talk about the inform function in our public affairs world. 
you know, they don't even have a, a true program of record for information production and, and delivery. So like, you know, you've got all these public affairs offices across the army and they have their own cameras, their own video devices that they record and, you know, they upload and they transfer and transit um, video and, and photo um, across um, the world, but there's no standard system. So organizations buy cameras here and there. Let's make something that is that is actually a the standard when it comes to what's the what's the camera that they're going to use, what's the video device they use, and how are they going to upload that and disseminate it across the world. So those are those those are the big buckets when we talk about material solutions. So, you know, finishing up on the material side, we go over to like leader development and education. So really we're looking at how do we, you know, we talk about training and how do we, how do we train our senior leaders? How do we train our officers and our non-commissioned officers and soldiers at every level? How do we have training in the information dimension? And this goes everything from interacting with the media to all the way up to um, how do you, how do you incorporate um, all these five tribes together at the theater army level. So all of those, we have to have some type of educational process in professional military education at all levels. Um, and then really the other one, that's the big one we talked to dot in the PFP is the last P the policy piece. Um, you know, we have standing policy out there um, that allow us to do certain things, but how do we, we are looking at refining some of those policies because they're a little old and outdated and not necessarily incorporating the, the information landscape where we want to do this. And this, this talks from just everything from the information operations publications to actually, you know, who owns the proponency of information advantage that just recently was assigned to the combined arms center, which is, um, I'm fall, I fall under the Cyber Center of Excellence with all the centers of excellence fall under the Combined Arms Center. So General Beagle, Lieutenant General Beagle as the CAC commander has overall proponency now for information advantage. Um, so that, that kind of helps us frame the policy. All of those things are the things the Army's kind of doing across the board when we talk of dot mil PFP. My goodness. Well, that is a very broad uh, scope indeed. Um, I wanted to just mention um, about a year ago, or maybe it was a little bit less, we had a, a fantastic discussion with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Burbank, who is out at um, uh, Fort Irwin, and he he leads the uh, ghost team. And he, he, mm -hmm. he described in great detail how, you know, they uh, are, are creating uh, a um, uh, exercise in, br brigade sized exercise environments uh which are really tailored towards uh you know uh, uh operations in the information environment and also uh dealing with you know like uh, simulated activities that forces are likely to be encountering in in, in the real world uh, do, do you and your team john uh interface with with uh uh those folks out there at Fort Irwin. It's actually interesting you say that because I think about a week and a half ago, I actually had a meeting uh, with the ghost team um, to see how we can um, see what they're learning there and incorporate it across the army. Now, the only thing is, is that, you know, at the national training center, we focus on mm -hmm. brigade size elements and uh, some division staff size elements. When we're talking about inf information advantage right now, uh, the army's focus solely at the theater army level. Um, reason being is number one, that's where we're tie that's where we're putting the tie ads right now. And number two, um, that's where we see um, where convergence really occurs when we talk about multi doom operations. The convergence of all of this really occurs at the core to theater level. So uh, we definitely want to see how they're conducting information activities at the tactical level, um, at the 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 National Training Center, um, but kind of focusing, taking those tactical level engagements and seeing how can they scale up to theater and enterprise wide. But yeah, we yeah, definitely been working yeah. with them. Yeah, yeah, Roger that. Well, there there will be a link to that episode in the show notes to our audience. Uh, anybody with that would like to check that out. Um, uh, I, okay, so um, also previously on the podcast uh, we had. Uh, 
uh, Army Major General John Davis on, and uh, we'll have a link in the show notes as well. And one of the things that I recall him emphasizing during his discussion was uh, the importance of relationships. And you, you talked about this a little bit before, John, as well, but I wanted to ask you again, um, you know, what are your thoughts about you know, the, the relationships that you currently have, uh, relationships that you would like to strengthen, you know, who, who are you talking to, uh, you know, across the joint force? Uh, what about the private sector? Um, take that in whatever direction you think is uh, productive. Yeah. So, you know, General Davis, great American, you know, worked with him uh, when Cyberkind first stood up, you know, I actually got a great opportunity to work with him for a couple of years. So, you know, he's still serving the cyber community well over at Palo Alto Network. So, you know, he, he's, he's spot on when we talk about relationships. Uh, they're definitely key in the space when we talk the information space. You know, as I said in the beginning, my job's really to herd cats, you know. So there's there's hundreds of stakeholders out there in this space um, with everyone has their own individual requirements and they want they have their own wants and needs. And, and we need to include the military, the government, the industry, the academia together every day to make this work. Um, we have to include our partners and our allies in theater to make to to meet our common objectives. Um, you know, we we've got to account for um, all these all these different organizations and um, armies across the across the world. You know, to to kind of go against our our common adversaries. Uh, we got and obviously we have to incorporate and cooperate with our joint partners and interagency partners because we don't fight as an army alone. You know, we fight as a joint force. So, um, you know, a great opportunity when when I when I actually met you out there at Phoenix Challenge. That's a great um, avenue for the joint force to kind of look at this information this information space um, because you know we fight as a joint force. Um, the, the funny thing is, is that, as I said kind of earlier, the army looked at the information space a little different. We didn't want to, we didn't want to grab it as a, a warfighting function. We thought it was something that has to go across all the warfighting functions. So we looked at it as, 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 as just a dimension in the operational environment. Um, but when we talk about relationships, that's that's key. Like, and it's not just. Um, internal to us in the Army. You know, when we talk about the Army, as I said before, I work with all the other uh, centers of excellence. I work with the special operations community. I work with um, the public affairs community. Um, you know, we work with all these different pieces of the pie, but we have to incorporate the operational force and the joint force um, because all of this together is, is in order to be successful. As I said from the beginning, we're continuing to seed ground against our adversaries. You know, our, our Chinese are continually to do, doing things in this space where we have to try and get in front of it the best we can. Um, and, and, you know, General Davis, spot on. That's where relationships are key, starting all the way at the senior army level, all the way down to the individual soldiers. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Well, um, I'd like to start uh, transitioning, closing it out, uh, John. This has been uh, fantastic. So maybe we can do a, a quick lightning round kind of a thing, 30 seconds sure. to one, one minute per, per topic, and then we'll, we'll shut her down. Uh, so first lightning round, space. All right, go. So space, we definitely have to incorporate them more into what we do when we talk about information advantage. Uh, they're, they're a part of our protect function, our attack function. Uh, we need to integrate the space forces and our tie it a little bit better. Um, we talk about them in our doctrine, um, what they're doing in, in the information space and the, and, and the space conducting information oper information activities uh, are, are really important to what we do in this space. Okay, so uh, second lightning round, open source intelligence or OSINT. I'd rather focus on public available information, PAI. So okay. as open source intelligence is an intelligence function that intelligence professionals conduct with specific authorities and oversight. When we talk about public available information, we can gather data in order to conduct analytics and build um, analytics to, to share data and assess the data and then we can share it across organization and with our partners and allies. So I think public available information, a little more important to us than OSINT. All right, understood. And uh, last lightning round, cybernetics. Ooh, interesting, interesting growing field. Um, you know, help us, help, definitely will help us better understand how people interact with systems, how systems interact with people, 
Um, I think it's, it, it, I think there's a lot of research that should be done in that world. Um, I think that's really the biggest piece to me is there's just a lot of research needs to be moved forward over there. Okay, so uh, very good. Uh, okay, last couple of questions. So we've got a lot of students and researchers who listen to this podcast. Could you offer a fruitful research question that an interested student might take a crack at? Huh. So I think the biggest one of that is what we're looking at is how do we help our commanders better see the information dimension? Um, so what I mean by that is how do we take all the various data sets that are out there? How do we take every individual piece of information that's out there and they interact with each other kind of in a um, neural network? They all affect each other. How can we bring those data points together into a, into a decision space? And where we talk about in that decision space, um, we have speed and accuracy. So our data coming to our commanders have to be fast and accurate. We want our adversaries to have less accurate and slower data. How do we present that to help a commander make a better decision in the decision space? Okay, excellent. And uh, last question, John, what is a good book or maybe an online resource that uh, you could suggest that somebody might check out if they want a deeper dive into this topic? Hmm, interesting. So, you know, we could talk about, you know, like war and modern, modern, you know, weaponizing the social media. That's kind of a, that's one that's kind of that, that social media space. Uh, Army of None. This is a book that I'm reading. It's called, you know, Honor, Army of None is Autonomous Weapons and, and the Future of Warfare. That's a, that's a pretty interesting book that talks about autonomous systems. Um, but that is huge in the information space. Um, and then maybe the art of invisibil invisibility. So we talk about, you know, you know, what what can a what can a hacker do to teach you to work in in the in the cyber domain? I think those three are things that kind of cover, you know, the information space being so dynamic. You know, I kind of looked at different ways of of touching different pieces of the information space. All right. Well, uh, uh, John Agnello, you have given us a lot to think about, and uh, we thank you so much for being a guest on the Cognitive Crucible. Thank you very much for your time. Great discussion. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.